Okay, so while I struggle with this, I'll let you guys go. Ahead. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, we can, I think for order, we'll do Diane, Hazel, and then Sage, if that's cool. Okay. If you guys want to introduce yourselves. And again, I really apologize for the technical issues on my end, but thanks for, thanks for sticking with me. If, I, if you see me fiddling with stuff, it's just because I'm trying to fix my stand. But yeah, we'll go ahead and start introductions, so. Okay. I'm Diane Newman, and I've been a cartoonist since 1972, so now I'm like one of the grand old fixtures. I teach um, drawing comics at SVA. I've done that for more than five years now, and it's going to be a new experience because I'm going to be doing it on Zoom um, starting the end of September. So I'm very happy to say that Drawing Power won an Eisner Award for Best Anthology and I really feel like it, it's everybody, you know, it's not, I'm the editor and I spent a lot of time on it. I did editing and organizing, but all these wonderful women, I mean, 62 women were part of it and they were very brave to do it, you know, and I, um, most of them I had never seen or heard of. I found them on Instagram and oh, wow. um, it was really good that way. I didn't put out an open call or anything. I just wrote to people whose work I'd seen and admired. And um, almost all of them had had an experience that was either, you know, sexual violence or harassment or somewhere in between. And I think one person said they had never had that experience, so she couldn't do it. Some people weren't ready to share it, you know. And um, it's been it's been very emotional. Um, one of the women was raped while she was working on this. Wow. Yes. And she died of an overdose. And I don't know if it's an overdose. I don't know why she died. Um, something medical. So, I, if I had known that, I would have dedicated the book to her, Noelle Franklin, mm -hmm. instead of, well, I, I probably wouldn't have, because I really, really wanted to dedicate the book to, um, I'm sorry, I lost the name. <laughs> God. Anyway, you can see it if you look at it. Anita Hill. Yeah. So, Dr. Hazel, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, I'm Hazel Nulevant. Uh I've been drawing comics since 2010. Uh, so that's relatively young in the game. Um, I also have edited several anthologies. Um, I these two, Chainmail Bikini and Comics for Choice, were ones that I published myself. Chainmail Bikini being about non-cis male gamers. Comics for Choice is different stories about abortion, people's personal experiences, but also things from doctors, lawyers, um, activists. And uh, I also co-edited Puerto Rico Strong, which came out from Lion Forge. Uh, and most recently, I was an artist in Guantanamo Voices, which just came out this month oh. and is an anthology of sorts because each uh, chapter is drawn by a different artist. Uh, and yeah, that's me. Oh. Go Sage. <laughs> Um, hi, my name is Sage Coffey. I use they, them pronouns. Uh, I co-edited the first Sweaty Palms. I also have a stack inspired by Hazel. Um, the first Sweaty Palms with Liz Enright. Uh, Sweaty Palms is an anthology about anxiety, but it also covers, um, anxiety is often present with other mental illnesses, um, bipolar disorder and OCD. Um, and the anthology really encapsulates all those experiences. Uh, volume two, I edited by myself. 
Um, EEK has over 45 artists from around the world. Um, some range from telling their experience in like a, okay, I started medication and like I got better. Um, others talk about what they were currently going through. Uh, as an editor, it's really important to me to um, make sure I amplify the voice uh, that is present um, and make sure they say exactly what they want to say and feel comfortable saying it. Sweaty Palm was really about providing a safe space to talk about mental illness. Um, I'm also a contributor in Be Gay Do Comics, uh, Comics for Choice. Um, I've been drawing since I was a little kid, but uh, I first got published by The Nib in 2015. So I'm also a baby cartoonist. <laughs> um, awesome. Oh, well Awesome, welcome. Um, so I'll introduce myself quickly. My name is Rachel Miller, or Dr. Rachel Miller. Still getting used to that. I just earned my doctorate from Ohio State University. Um, I do my studies there, specifically focused on comics. Um, my research is about comics and zines in the 90s, mini comics, um, and anthology comics, actually. And uh, now I teach comics over at the Columbus College of Art and Design. So I'm really excited to have you all here tonight and thank you for um, contributing your time to this. So I wanted to get started. You guys have already kind of started to talk a little. I'm interested in how, um, how each of these anthology projects came about. Um, you know, Comics for Choice, Drawing Power, and Sweaty Palms. Um, where, where were these projects coming from? And what, where were you in your lives as you began to conceptualize of these projects? Uh, comics for choice, I'll just go. Um, I had the, <laughs> I said I would go and now I'm being inarticulate. Anyway, I co-edited oh, this with uh, Wit Taylor and OK Fox, and the genesis of it was very much uh, tied up with them. Um, I the initial idea came probably in mid twenty sixteen, so before Trump was elected. Uh, I like saw a segment on Samantha Bee's show about um, trap laws closing abortion clinics and various states and just like felt outraged for people to not be able to have access to that and I was like what what's the most effective thing for me to do like should I become a clinic escort what and okay was actually the one who went you make anthologies, you make, you publish comics. I had already published Chainmail Bikini, so they suggested, you know, why not make this a book and then you can sell it to uh, raise money for abortion funds. Uh, yeah, so they, I wouldn't have made this an anthology if not for them. And then I, uh, talked to Wit about it and she offered to help me with it because she has worked in public health. Um, and also she edited the Subcultures Anthology, which came out from Ninth Art Press, which I don't think is super well known, but was very inspirational to me before I started publishing. Um, but I put it off because I was like, this could attract some ire and um, I would be responsible for uh, <laughs> learning so much about abortion and like, you know, making sure that I'm accurately reflecting. I mean, not me, but, you know, making sure that editorially, like the medical and legal aspects are all on point. So I put it off. But then um, after Trump was elected, I decided it was back on and Wit and OK helped me put it together. And we um, worked with some 
some folks at an organization called We Testify, who are essentially like abortion storytellers who like share the stories of their abortions, you know, in different contexts to advocate for abortion access. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they already were used to like, you know, and wanted to share these stories for a political impact. Um, so we worked with a lot of those storytellers and paired them up with different artists who wanted to donate their time to the project. Uh, and similarly, we paired up a few historians and um, people who work for abortion funds, stuff like that. But there are also a lot of cartoonists who had their own stories to say that didn't need to be paired up either like their own abortions or, um, you know, they were people who already had some medical or legal expertise also. Uh, so that was how it came together. And Sage was one of the contributors, which I was really mm -hmm. glad to have them in it. Aw, thanks. Um, yeah, it's an amazing, it's an amazing anthology, so. Oh, thank you. Um, well, like Diane was saying, it's just a testament to all the contributors and, you know, the work that they put in and what they were willing to share. There actually so was an anthology. Oh, I'm sorry. I just started Oh, talking. no, go, go ahead, Diane. Go ahead. Yeah. Actually, Trina Robbins um, edited an abortion anthology in the, I don't know if it was the 70s or the 80s, and I did a story called The C Word for Choice, but a huge amount, there was a huge amount of work done, and I know that there probably is a, a big gap between that and, and your book now, but it's connected and it, it did exist. I think a lot of times I feel like those things disappeared, you know, and they shouldn't yeah. have. That is really unfortunate how little known that is. I mean, I, shit, I feel like I should have known about that, but it, well, no, it was a long time ago. Up in mm -hmm. my research, but. Yeah, I guess that does just show that there have been all of these different phases of fighting for abortion access and like a lot of things stay the same or just transmute into different forms of ways people are trying to cut it off. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, as you were talking, Diane, and then you, Hazel, I was thinking about when I was curating the show Ladies First for the Billy Ireland, which is uh, it surveys 100 years of women's work in comics. Um, there's a, there's a um, issue of birth control review from the 1920s in that show that shows a woman, it's, there's a drawing, I think it's by Lou Rogers on the cover, and it shows a woman who has like, um, like a ball and chain behind her, and like the ball and chain is, it says like unwanted pregnancy. And it's interesting, like just, you know, how, these issues obviously like changed over time, but really we're kind of, we're still fighting um, same, same battles. And, um, you know, uh, it's just kind of interesting how that, that continuance. Um, so, yeah, but so Diane, would you talk about where uh, Drawing Power came from, this project that you were um, Anger. Yeah. I, yeah. I, was, I think I watched the Trump, um, interview where he said grab him by the pussy and I it was just the last straw there had been headlines you know with famous people one after another getting you know finally getting their headlines saying that they were sexual abusers and um not that they all went to jail but some of them did Anyway, I was, I was just so angry. And I was like you, Hazel, I just thought, well, what can I do? I'm a cartoonist and an editor, and I'm, I can put the book together, you know? And that was the, really the reason I started. So were you working on drawing power from the point, like when the election happened, you, you know, you started this project or did it take 
like Hazel, um, a little, a, a, a few years or? It took a long time. Um, yeah. I started working on it before, some people agreed to work on it before I had a publisher. Um, but I was very lucky to get Abrams. They were very, very supportive. And um, I really appreciated it. And it could get, you know, wide distribution, which is a dream I, it's very hard to, to get. So, right. plus I met all these wonderful people through it. And some of them, you know, I knew in some from other times, but we had a, had a book tour and I got to meet a lot of the cartoons because they live geographically spread out. And so I got, I didn't get to meet all of them, you know, I would have loved to, but I got to meet quite a few. And that was really important to me. I was really happy to do that. I, I want to say I did another anthology. I can't, I'm looking to see, I, did, I didn't even think of putting it out, but Twisted Sisters. Um, right. The first one was called A Collection of Bad Girl Art, and the second one was called um, Drawing the Line. And they were both Twisted Sisters, one and two, and different publishers. And I, start, I learned from doing that what it meant. And I think I didn't really realize what it meant to be an editor. Um, a lot of what you said, Sage, really resonated with me because that's what you have to do. You have to amplify their voice. And as an editor, sometimes some people just give you the stuff and you know you don't have to change it, but sometimes you do because they're not getting across what they hope to. So you're trying to help them do that. And that's um, really hard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> especially like because you don't, want to talk over them, right? Like, you know, naturally your voice as an editor is going to come out in their work because you're the editor, but like, it's so important not only for them to have a platform to feel safe to share what they're feeling, but also have a platform to be listened to. I really yeah, I thought really... that, oh, I'm sorry. Oops. No, go ahead, Diane. I, I really thought that what was important to me with Drawing power was to get points of view from as many different aspects as I could, different um, ages. Like Joyce Farmer is in her eighties, and oh, wow. I think the youngest one is one of my students at SVA, and um, she did a really powerful story. And when I saw it in class, I knew I wanted it to be in the book. So the other thing is as many races and you know as many uh, different countries as possible and in one way I was disappointed because there wasn't time to translate so I had to get people who spoke English no matter where they were from but I did get Lebanon and just a, a lot of places. Yeah I think that really highlights one of the strengths of anthologies, you know, being able to have so many different perspectives yeah. on perhaps on a particular topic. You know, I know not all anthologies are organized by subject matter, but you know, these ones that we're talking about are. Um, and, you know, then being able to take those stories and put it on bookshelves and in libraries where they might mm -hmm. not otherwise have access to that distribution. And, you know, the responsibility of an editor when you're trying to bring a broad range of viewpoints to find the right people, like how do we reach out? Um, you know, how, yeah, I guess the responsibility to like convey things from a broad range of viewpoints and, you know, like Jamie L. Bikini, there are no black contributors, unfortunately. Uh, Comics for Choice, you know, I think that we hit like abortion experiences from quite a wide variety of angles, but I read a review on Women Write About Comics saying that, you know, it was not as attentive to ability and disability and how those factor into abortion as 
mm. you know, the, the other things that we were thinking about as editors. Uh, so yeah, that's definitely yeah. part of the challenge of doing an anthology well. But Sage, I, you should talk about the genesis of Sweaty Palms. Oh, <laughs> um, I feel like I've told this story a million times, but to me, it's, it's always funny a little bit because it's, um, it's before I actually got diagnosed with panic disorder and um, before I got diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder. Because um, it started out with me just being too nervous to hit a button to get off on the right stop on the bus. Um, I was worried about inconveniencing people. I didn't want to be the person, the one person to get off on a stop. Um, and I was on, yeah. on my way to my friend Liz's house, uh, Liz Enright, who was the, uh, one of the editors on the first one. Um, and we talked about like things like that. Uh, she was also going through a lot at the time that um, I don't feel comfortable disclosing because it's not my story to tell. Um, but we talked about it and we were like, how many more people like feel this, this like smallness, the need to small them, like make them smaller for other people and the need to hide these feelings and not talk about them openly. Um, and that was probably in like 2015. Uh, 2016 is when we started getting pages and getting the ball rolling on uh, Sweaty Palms Volume 1 Kickstarter. Um, which is actually also when I had my abortion. <laughs> it was a it was a busy year. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was that was the beginning of sweaty palms. Um, it was definitely important to us that people be able to tell their own stories, um, even like if they weren't the best at drawing or anything. We would always encourage folks like, this is you know it's okay to express yourself visually. And if that's not something you're comfortable doing, that's totally okay. We're gonna have future volumes. Um, you know, there were definitely a lot of contributors who uh, ended up dropping just because they weren't uh, ready to talk about certain things or they hadn't processed certain things or revisiting things that had happened or were happening that were too painful. Um, and I feel like my role as an editor in that is to just be supportive, you know? I'm not gonna get upset at somebody because they were too anxious to work on pages or too depressed to work on pages. Um, because it's a, it's a very, very vulnerable thing to express. Um, and I really, really want to respect that vulnerability because it takes a lot of trust. It takes a lot of trust to trust someone, not only to like present your story to them, but to trust them to publish it and distribute it. You know what I mean? Right. I something that I'm noticing that all y'all are kind of picking up on is this like power of anthologies to gather together many different voices. And the topics of all the anthologies that we're spotlighting in this panel are things that like culturally there has been like silence or like a lack of visuality around. So like sexual assault, um, you know, reproductive rights, abortion, anxiety. Right. So I'm wondering, you know, um, how, why, I wouldn't, I just wonder if you could talk a little bit more about like the, the benefits of that anthology format and like how, you know, why is this a format that we keep coming back to in comics? I think Diane, you know, I think about women's comics and I think about Twisted Sisters and like the power of those anthologies, you know, so I'm interested in why anthologies and why, you know, I just Why wanted to say, um, I forgot to mention Me Too, which was also a huge deal. And it made me want to do this project for people who weren't famous, you know, just ordinary people who happened to be good cartoonists and were able to tell their stories. And they all told them in different ways, you know, that's a lot of different voices, a lot of different perspectives. And to me, that adds to the power of the book. Like you were saying, it's these women's stories and they're brave enough to come out and do them. It was also important to me that they did them well. So 
um, but in many different ways, you know, there's as many different styles and voices as like poetic voices and in your face voices and, you know, um, that to me was really important as, as well. And it just kind of happened. And I think to piggyback off of that, like, also presenting, um, oh, sorry, that's me. The side. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> I've had my dog barking the whole time, so <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> um, piggybacking off of that, I think it's really, really important to have a variety of styles and variety of experiences because, you know, if something like anxiety, there are cultural aspects to it, right? Different cultures talk about or don't talk about mental health in a certain way. Um, and so many people experience anxiety in different ways. Like for me, I get very, very intense panic attacks. Um, and so because of that, I'm very, uh, I'm able to distinguish between panic attacks and anxiety attacks, which a lot of people aren't able to because they experience anxiety differently. Um, and they don't, because they haven't experienced certain things, they don't necessarily have the language to talk about it. So like talking about it visually is the best way they can depict their feelings. Um, I feel like uh, Luke Howard did a fantastic job in Sweaty Palms Volume 2, um, simulating what depression and mania felt like in a, the formatting of his comic. Um, it's, I think, very experimental in a way, but um, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know where I was going with that, but uh, yeah, I think comics gives visuals to feelings we can't perhaps express with words. Yeah, and I, I mean, go ahead, Hazel. Oh, I was just going to say that, you know, I think that people do connect with the subject matter just in different ways, you know, when they can see it or, you know, people are drawing their own experiences. And, you know, I don't have a fully fleshed out theory on that because it's kind of like, why are comics good? Why do we like comics? But, you know, I can certainly say that, you know, all of these different, all of these stories are reaching different audiences than they would otherwise. Um, and I think there's an element of making difficult subject matter potentially more approachable or at least have a way into it. Um, you know, that was certainly the theory behind Guantanamo Voices, which I just did some art for, which is, um, stories from different people who have been at the prison, a lot of prisoners, but also guards, lawyers, people who've worked there. Um, yeah, just an intention to have things be not forgotten, but also more approachable. Uh, but that's, that's the perspective of, I guess, sharing stories and, um, the people who are reading the anthologies, but I think they bring a lot for creators and editors. Um, I think that, well, certainly for me, seeing Spike Trotman's anthologies on Kickstarter, um, you know, she like kind of revitalized a whole sensibility of anthologies and, you know, created a model for funding where um, contributors get bonuses the more money it's making. So um, that just made it seem approachable as an editor that, you know, I was just coming out of art school, but I felt like I could put something like that together. Um, you know, so, you know, I think it can be a great way to get a bunch of artists paid if you structure it fairly or you know a great way to raise money for something um it comes together faster than 
uh, something that was 200 or 300 pages by the same artist, um, which I think allows so many of these anthologies to be really timely because everyone is working on their own chunks of it and then it gets out there. Um, and yeah, it allows these shorter pieces from, you know, maybe people who don't want to do a whole graphic novel or just haven't yet to then have access to these channels of distribution and visibility that books get. Um, also, yeah, I, go, I never go thought on. about that. I never thought about that, Hazel, that um, it's kind of, anthologies are almost, they combine like the best things about like graphic novels and mini comics, right? So like mini comics are very short. You can do them uh, fairly quickly in most cases, but graphic novels, they take a long time, but they're long form. And anthologies are kind of like the perfect melding of those two things. I'd never, I'd never thought about it like that. Oh, good, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it's <laughs> definitely good in a similar way of mini comics as you know, it can be practice for artists or I guess another thing that anthologies can do is put new artists with very established, already famous artists. So that's kind of a nice way for the rising tide to lift all boats. Uh, and my colleague, Wendy Chan Tanner, who I work with at A Wave Blue World, actually said something great about anthologies, which I had never thought of. Uh, she said that they're like the literary journals of comics in terms Ooh. of sort of like a lower okay not a lower step uh, but but just like a more approachable entry point into publication and then you get um publication credits under your belt so you know not I, being in the literary word never never thought of that i also think that um going back to like approachability uh it kind of gives the reader power of like how much they're able to um, read about a certain subject matter, especially when it's like things that can be particularly triggering like anxiety and sexual assault, um, giving the reader a power, like the power to say, okay, that was intense. I can put this down um, and I can revisit these different stories whenever I need to. Um, I think that's a really, really important aspect about anthologies that I don't think gets uh, talked about a lot. <laughs> yeah. Right, there's sure. like, um, there's almost a comfort too um, in knowing that so many different people from different backgrounds, um, different genders, you know, different um, races, et cetera, have all had similar experiences, right? There's kind of a comfort in, being a part of that like community in a sense right as, as a reader oh that was like yeah. super duper wild when um <laughs> sorry to interrupt that was super oh, no, no. Duper wild uh i so both sweaty palms um 15 contributors were uh invited and then uh the rest were all uh it was open call and i was floored at some of the comics i would read or submissions i would read i would help from script to final pages um, were so similar, but like under different circumstances. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, I guess showing the breadth and commonality of certain experiences is another thing that all of our anthologies are attempting. I was sorry that I left out men. There's plenty of men who've been sexually assaulted. That's fair. And I found it much just more easy to contact women. Mm -hmm. And I, there's a lot of, I know a lot of men cartoonists, you know, all different ages. And I can't quite imagine, you know, writing them and saying, can you, do you want to do a comment about your um, sexual harassment or rape and you know there's a huge amount and I wound up with one guy and the editors thought it would be weird to have just one guy in there so um, I thought it would have been really interesting because um, 
I can't remember where he was from, some place where they had uh, Madras schools and he was talking about how the, you know, it's just power is what happens. It skews everything. And um, so they had the power over these young boys and they violated them very often, like Catholic priests, you know. Yeah, I think, I mean, so it, maybe there's room for a second installment of Drawing Power where, you know, men get a chance to tell their stories, non-binary people get a chance to tell their stories, um, you know. Well, there's a lot of different um, sexual orientations. There's lots of people, um, there's a couple of trans women and there's many gay women and mm -hmm. um, I just, that are included wanted, in the anthology. That was easier. For, yeah, I was, I was okay to, it was easy for, to do that. Mm -hmm. and just, I had, I was, I found myself in, inhibited about asking men about that. And mm -hmm. um, I certainly would if I did it again. I don't know if I will because this was a huge amount of work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't think cool. people, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead, Paige. Oh, I just wanted to say, like, uh, especially being a the only editor on an anthology, or even splitting up the work, it's it's very much like a like a second part time job, if that's not already your part time or full time job. <laughs> uh, I I don't think I can count the amount of hours that I put into sweaty palms personally. <laughs> Yeah, I was wondering um, what your advice would be to other cartoonists who want to make that transition and start putting together their own anthologies, um, if, if any, if any advice, <laughs> because we obviously need more anthologies in the world. <laughs> I think it's depth of feeling. You have to really have a connection to the subject and, and feel it to try to connect with other people who have had the similar experience. And I think that's really important. I think giving a voice to the Guantanamo people is um, incredible because that's certainly been um, overlooked as, as much as possible, you know. Yeah, that's kind of the theme of the book is like an antidote to forgetting that, you know, just because we have new scandals every day does it like this still hasn't been dealt with and the you know types of like isolation and torture that have been done at Guantanamo just spread so yeah it doesn't really have that beautifully put Hazel like an antidote to forgetting like I feel like anthologies are kind of they kind of serve that purpose, particularly like throughout comics history, right? I, it's hard sometimes to get your hands on individual comics, <laughs> but um, I've always been able to track down like anthologies, like women's comics or Twisted Sisters, um, Action Girl comics. So yeah, I, I love that. Um, also, um, not being afraid to start small and fail. Um, I feel like a lot of the anthologies that we're showing visually um, and that we're representing are very large. <laughs> it's a big page count. Um, and I, I think like, especially if you're a teen, I want more teen comics um, or something like that. Just getting together with your friends and making something. Like there's so much satisfaction in just having something finished and doing it together. Um, the first anthology I ever made, I made my sophomore year of college. Uh, it's called Dandy Doodle Dandy. Please don't look it up because it's terrible. <laughs> um, and it was all about like what punk means to different people. Um, because it has a variety of definitions, whether you're looking at like the individual music scene or the fashion scene or the mentality. Um, exploring that was very interesting to me. Um, but it was me and like maybe six other people. And especially depending on where you are in your life, like maybe that's all you can handle, like prepare for the work, um, both like mentally and physically. <laughs> um, physically being like, of course, the hours put into book design and things like that. Um, mentally being prepared to be there for your contributors. 
being prepared to be there, um, be, being present for your contributors, I'd say, is important. Um, because if you're checked out, you're not helping that contributor. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, zine preservation, I've recently been digging into um, like flip side zine, um, which is from the 90s. Uh, and uh, my, my dad died, unfortunately, when I was two. Um, but he was interviewed in these zines. Oh, wow. And um, getting to know him through those interviews, uh, through a culture that I had no idea I would be a part of years later, obviously. Um, and they are very difficult to find uh, specific issues and like doing the research and stuff. But I think that, you know, it speaks to the importance of preservation of these scenes. Like Diane, you mentioned that uh, abortion anthology from years and years before uh, Comics for Choice. Like, that's so important. <laughs> it's so important that, that we, we preserve that history. I was also thinking about women's comics and we talk about starting small. It was very small and I think that they went through so many publishers and if a Kickstarter had been around then, it would have made it much more just easier. It would have made it like like the Dirty Diamonds women, all of their all of their things were raised from Kickstarters. You know, that's amazing. So and it I speaks to like to add that. it speaks to distribution too, because there there is a certain amount of gatekeeping with publishing, mainstream publishing and distribution, um, and like a lot of um, flip side that I've seen at least is like located in LA because it was printed in LA. Um, Kickstarter definitely opened up the doors to like sending sweaty palms to Brazil. Um, sending sweaty palms, you know, I'm in Chicago sending it to California, sending it to Texas. Um, yeah, uh, I think that's another thing about older anthologies is a lot of them are harder to find because they're confined to that locale. Um, Diana, I'm curious now how, because I know you edited those uh, two Twisted Sisters collections and then you worked with women's comics. How did you solve that problem of production and distribution, um, finding finding a printer, that sort of thing? Well, it, it was different. I mean, the first, the first Twisted Sisters was all previously published work that I wanted to get out more into the world than just from women's comics because I felt the work was so strong and there were people who were saying things like, you know, women do like, frilly stuff or, you know, silly stuff and not strong work. And so I was, that, that was actually a lot easier to do than any of the others because it was work that was already, I just asked people for permission to do it, you know, and, um, and I was lucky. I got to, I met an editor from Viking Penguin his name was David Stanford, and he was very open to comics. He really liked comics, and I didn't know what I was doing. I just brought a dummy of the book, you know, and he agreed to do it. So I was all excited because I thought, well, we'd really get into, like, shopping malls and things, but um, they just kind of, they sold I don't know, 12,000 copies, and then they heaved a sigh of relief and didn't reprint it, you know. We need that to be reprinted. <laughs> I, would like, I would like that. Yeah. And the second one was, was just work from artists who I really liked, and I asked to do a story, and I probably didn't even give them a page amount, you know, depending on what what the how I had to organize it, you know. Um, I was originally going to do that with Aileen Kaminsky Crumb, but she moved to France. And I just decided it was too important. I wanted to do it and I did it on my own. 
um, we had the idea together, which was using the word, you know, Twisted Sisters, it's a comic book we did in 1976. So right. I think I've always had a, a desire to put work together like that. I did another comic book anthology called um, Let Me Out of Here, which was um, men and women and all on the theme of um, life in suburbia. <laughs> <laughs> I need to find that one. Um, so we're getting close to time, but I'm interested in uh, what the feedback and impact has been for these um, different anthology projects. Um, reader feedback, feedback from other artists. Have you guys been able to gauge that? And, and what has the impact been? I was actually really afraid when I when I did this book and I thought I'm going to go to bookstores and, you know, get shot or something, you know, it was scary because wow. there's a lot of men who are very angry and there's all these men that are, you know, running people down with trucks and they have really antagonistic attitudes towards women just in general, not even with this touchy subject. So, but I didn't have anything like that. <laughs> I, I had a lot of positive reaction. Someone who gave me one of the best feelings about the book was Robert Crumb. And that's, I know that a lot of people hate his work and there's a whole thing about it, but he read it all in one night. He read it through and he told me how much he liked it and how well it was edited and just, so I, I think you can reach a lot of different people in different ways, surprising sometimes. Hazel, do you wanna go? Sure. Yeah, so as far as the impact and response, at least to Comics for Choice, um, it was, decently effective for raising money for the national network of abortion funds. We were able to donate about $13,000 to them. Mm -hmm. uh, and they've been able to continue to use it as an educational resource. Um, it's a pay what you want PDF on their site because we wanted to make it as accessible as possible. Um, I think the, the people who I've most heard from who were like, personally touched by it have been contributors. Um, I guess because that's who, you know, I tend to converse with face to face. I mean, I think it means a lot to some readers, but, you know, I think definitely for contributors, it gave like a context to stories that they wouldn't have shared otherwise. And like, you know, created a camaraderie just within that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I can't think of anything else on that right now. That, that's like the camaraderie is very real. <laughs> like, um, we did this together. It's real. It's a thing. It's a physical. Yeah, it's so it's nice together. when you have like a big group release party or a tour like Diane did. Um, when I did Chainmail Bikini, I mean, that being my first anthology, I feel like that meant a lot in terms of just getting to meet the other contributors. And yeah. I was like, these are all such amazing cartoonists. Now I have, I have tied them to me in some sense. <laughs> have to be my friends. Just kidding. Uh, but um, no, the way that it connects people can be really cool. I, uh, every time I meet a contributor for the first time, I feel like I tear up. <laughs> I'm, I'm just so happy. <laughs> I'm just so happy to meet them after like working with them for so long. Production time yeah. for Sweaty Palms is like a year and a half or so of dedicated like script to thumbnails, thumbnails to pencils, pencils to inks, inks to lettering. And not every contributor needs that. Um, some benefit from the lack of structure, but some really need the structure. Um, 
and just working that closely with somebody, you get that connection naturally, I feel. Yeah, that's true. It can be a whole process of developing a piece together, which is um, a really fulfilling aspect of it. Yeah. And I also feel like I learned a lot. Um, Sweaty Palms, I, I donate to youth centers um, and therapists and libraries as much as I'm able to. Um, or, you know, those who will accept the donation. Um, and I hope it has a positive impact on those folks' lives. I know the first one, we had some reader feedback that uh, was overall like, oh, fantastic anthology. I wish there was a way for me to know what was coming, though. Um, because it, it would transition between stories of different subject matters, and some of those subject matters were very triggering. Mm. Um, the second one uh, in the index I put content warnings for each one that's smart yeah, that's <laughs> I want to so make sure interesting. people are able to navigate the book for them you know um, it's it's not just about how I want the book to be read as an editor it's about the reader's experience reading the book and connecting with the stories if there's a story that they're not ready for then they have the power to put it down um, and they know they can skip that one or they can revisit it later or, you know. Um, but yeah, overall reception has been really good. People will come up to me at conventions and be like, I had no idea I have uh, OCD because this person experiences the same thing I experience. Or um, I'll have par a lot of parents come up to me and be like, I had no idea this is what my child meant when they say that they're experiencing anxiety. Um, and it's, it's moments like that that like just make me feel like I did good. <laughs> I did good by, by making this a reality. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, do, do you? Were you able to pay the contributors? Either I was, people? yes. I, um, since going through Kickstarter, I was able to pay them $25 per page. plus a $50 Kickstarter bonus um, because we reached our first stretch goal. Uh, of course, now, like as an adult, uh, I was editing these. I was 21, 22 when Sweaty Palms Volume 1 came out. Um, so now I know how severely under, underpaid those contributors are, which I'm deeply regretful of. Um, and I think next time around, it will be a, a larger page rate, definitely. Um, but I'm very grateful that I was able to pay them in the first place. Yeah, that's incredible, especially for like a first time, first issue of an anthology. That's awesome. But I think we're, just about at time. So I want to thank you all for, again, contributing your time to this panel. I learned so much from you. And um, I love all of the work that you're doing with these anthologies. And it was just a real pleasure to get to talk through them with you. So thank you so much. Oh, thank, thank you. you.